I'm Eric Alexander, and I'd like to talk about curricular design. The goals in the next 15 minutes or so are to review the background and history as it relates to curricular design. I'm going to define what it means to be a curriculum. We'll talk about differing viewpoints of learning that affect how you create a curriculum, but we'll try and be very practical, and we'll end by giving you five guiding principles for curriculum development and some organizational frames in which you should consider your curriculum, and we'll end with some current examples. So I'll start with this. I want you to think through this problem. How would you teach someone to tie their shoe? Or this, how would you teach someone to sing? Or perhaps the hardest question, how would you train someone to be a doctor? And the answers that you have conveyed are really a plan, but the plan is more than that. It really is an educational curriculum. Fundamentally, a curriculum is an educational plan that acknowledges that learning is optimized only when multiple facets of the learning process are synergized, organized, and integrated over time. A curriculum is more than just good teaching. It's more than just having clear objectives or ensuring that a skill is mastered. A curriculum is really how the pieces are put together. Before we talk about the practical process of defining and designing a curriculum, I want to talk to you about the history of curricular development. And there were a few defining moments. About 100 years ago, Bobbitt first thought about schooling and realized that similar to factory work coming out of the Industrial Revolution, schooling itself could be reduced to a structured and efficient technique. And this had a major impact also on the publication of the Flexner Report. The Flexner Report, of course, defined the modern approach to medical school curriculum. About 20 or 30 years later, another big step forward came when Tyler introduced a disciplined approach to teaching, largely embracing the educational psychology and the process and understanding of behaviors. And you may be most familiar here with the concept of Miller's Pyramid that we've really all come to embrace that as a student moves forward, they are moving from knowing to knowing how to showing to finally doing. This really formalized itself then in the 1970s with the field of study that we now refer to as curricular design. But as soon as this was created, there then followed the debate on the utility of this process. And what is the debate? Well, on one side, it is this concept that we acknowledge there are guiding principles that will improve our teaching. And the bigger the deliverable of teaching, the more design that may be needed. A plan really will be helpful. But others will logically argue that you really don't want to constrain learning that systems are different, needs are different at the core, each of us as learners are different, and that formality at times is the enemy of creativity and self-direction, and that curricular design can simply lead to too much formality in the process. This ongoing debate has been in existence for decades and may not ever end, but allows you to put your hands around the thought process as we move forward. Now, as we think about designing a curriculum, I'll ask you this intriguing question. What is your view of learning? Do you feel that learning at its core is a transmission? It is the function of schooling simply to be viewed as transmitting facts, skills, and other values to students. And the goal is simply for the student to master knowledge. Or is learning really more of a transaction? That at the core, the student is a rational and capable individual. They can intelligently problem solve. And so education at its core is a dialogue between the student and the curriculum in which student reconstructs the knowledge through a dialogical process that you really have to put it in perspective. Or do you view learning as a transformational process? This really is all about how the person, the learner, changes. There's an interdependence and movement towards harmony as the teacher and the learner work together. But the students ultimately must really want to learn what they desire. If you follow the first concept and believe in the transmission theory, then you really follow B.F. Skinner, the long-term chair of Harvard Department of Psychology, who championed this model. If you are a believer that education is more of a transaction, that really falls under Jean Piaget, who did a great deal of work and led the concept and area of child psychology for decades. And if you believe education is more of a transformational process, uh, then you are similar to Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, who really uh, led the concept of uh, thought and behavior and education uh, following the French Revolution. None of these is correct. None of them is wrong. They are all simply different viewpoints, but they must allow you to frame your uh, design of a curriculum uh, within one of these perspectives. And equally as important, just so you've heard it once, there are also conceptual frameworks to curricular development, and I will share two of them with you. There is the social efficiency model, the concept here that you start with behavioral learning objectives, 
You then move on and determine the content decisions that must be made, and finally that leads then to what you teach and the instructional methods. But another equally reasonable framework is the human development model. And this one really starts with the needs of the learner and their developmental stage, and really understanding the learner then would allow you to modify your instructional method to match that learning style. And finally, at the end, you progress to content. The first is a little bit that we know what's best and how it should be taught. It's a very top-down approach. But the second is a blended model. The needs of the students come first. Learning how to learn is just as important as the knowledge itself. It's much more bottom-up. And making this even more complex, we should acknowledge that there's a lot of diversity in education. And as we think about developing any curriculum, we can think that there's diverse needs on a local, regional, state, or national level. There's a big difference in how you would think about your own teaching session versus planning a clerkship or perhaps a four-year curriculum. Or if you were teaching kindergarten or you were teaching professional school. And also, what is your goal when you're teaching? Is it to discover or is it a topic-driven learning process? How are we assessing the student? And what is your role in the educational process? All of these factors will create equal diversity and complexity to how you think about a curriculum. But to bring all of this together, when we ask the question, what is a curriculum? Well, it's a system. It's a plan. It's a process to facilitate teaching and learning. But it's embedded within your viewpoint of the learning process and your conceptual framework for curriculum design. But what's critical here is that we all acknowledge there is a logic to how any system of learning and teaching is created, even if we disagree on the viewpoint or framework you bring to the process. At the end, the whole of the process is better than the sum of its part. And therefore, we should all agree that curricular planning is critical and improves the educational process. Now, I'd like to move from the background into being more practical. And as you think about designing a curriculum, I want to talk you through five commonly accepted steps to developing this process. And of course, they will be adapted to your own philosophy of learning and your framework. So first, you need to define your objectives. What are your endpoints? Uh, what is it that you want? The goal here really is going to drive how you think about developing your curriculum. You really do need to be thoughtful. You really need to be realistic. But you do need to define that endpoint because at the end of the day, being faithful to the endpoint will drive a successful curriculum. The next step is to build a curricular map. Knowing where you're going and how you're going to get there is just as important as knowing the endpoint. And you may ask, what is a curricular map? And there are many different ways to build one. I show you here simply one that is an outline or blue skying of different ideas. This was a curriculum map for a high school unit. And here they just decided to create columns. The first was that they would define the themes that they wanted to teach. What are the enduring understandings they wanted the students to know? And they talked about really more assessment, how students will demonstrate their learning, and then what are some standards-based essential skills, et cetera, et cetera. And this allowed them to really begin to brainstorm and blue sky the process. But you could build a curricular map that looks more like a figure. This one, as you see, is a curricular map related to a writing course in the grade 12 of high school. And they decided that there would be some big figures here and kind of overarching themes that would exist throughout the course. But they could then really bring down their map to four big issues. The first is there would be teaching methods, there would be writing activities, and then there would be content standards. And then they essentially filled them out here below. Or, perhaps most related to the medical community, this is aligning your courses with educational methods and evaluation methods. So this group was looking to develop a clerkship for family medicine and really began by thinking first about their different courses and then really thinking about their 11 educational methods and finally their eight evaluation methods. Then for this clerkship in family medicine, they were able to think for each patient case presentation that they would align course experiences, evaluation methods, etc. A very structured approach. Each of these is a very reasonable approach to curricular mapping. The third step then is to organize and create a blueprint. This is really how it all comes together. Now you know where you're going. You've really brainstormed and mapped out what you need to teach and put together. And this is where you become the chief operating officer. And I will emphasize to you what I think is a very important point, that the devil really is in the details. As you move on to your fourth point, I'm going to stress quite a bit the importance of right-sizing your curriculum and also ensuring a good fit in the system. It's really critical that you consider the other forces that may impact your success. Because I would argue that 
The most common reason for incomplete success is that your curriculum does not live in a vacuum. We each live within a hospital or another teaching structure or a separate uh, entity that has competing demands, and your curriculum must be aware of that. And I'd like to take a little bit of a tangent to talk further about this concept of other forces. I think one of the best ways to think about the other forces that can impact your curriculum is to return to a book that was written by Lee Bowman and Terry Deal that is referred to as Reframing Organizations. And they made an argument that as a leader, you should view your organization and therefore your curriculum through various lenses, realizing that you and your curriculum exist within a social construct. Well, what is a lens, or they will refer to it as a frame? This is a set of concepts, metaphors, and values which provide a scaffolding for organizing experience in the real world. Nobody uses only one frame or one lens at a time. All are important, and I'll walk you through these different lenses or frames. First is the concept that you should view your curriculum within this entity we refer to as a structural frame. The origins of this are really more in sociology but in management science, that each of us have goals in an organization, roles, and relationships that we are actually linked together via a hierarchical tree. And so there are responsibility, there are rules, there are policies, there are procedures. But if you don't consider this when you launch your curriculum, the problem will arise when the structure does not fit the situation. If you are right here, but don't really report up to notify your supervisor about your curriculum, this can lead to trouble. Bowman and Deal would also argue that you should really learn and consider the human resources frame when you launch a curriculum, because organizations are more than just a structure. They're really an extended family that we all have needs, feelings, prejudices, skills, and limitations. It has a psychological framework to it. But if you launch your curriculum and you don't take note of this, you will find that the challenge then will be to tailor the organization to people, find a way for individuals to get the job done while feeling good about what they're doing. A simple thank you, a simple showing up to introduce a speaker as part of your broad curriculum can go a long way to making them feel valued. A third frame, according to Bowman and Deal, will be to make sure you are aware of the politics. Of course, its origins are in political science, but organizations are not just structures or related in terms of the human entity, but they are also at times contests, or as the two authors would discuss, jungles. There are differing interests competing for power, and therefore there can be conflict and competitive nature. And so you have to bargain, you have to negotiate. And if you don't, the problem will arise when power begins to be concentrated in the wrong place. So always be alert to the politics in your organization and how your curriculum fits into that. And symbolically, take into consideration that we actually all value the symbolism of what we are within a hospital and our organization. So you need to play your part and symbolically also appreciate what others are doing for your curriculum. So when I say right size and ensure a good fit, this is really what I'm talking about. I think there's a real value here in asking yourself, where might I go wrong with regards to the structural frame or lens, or perhaps the human resource frame or lens, or the political frame, or symbolically, what am I missing? If you do that, I think you ensure then a much better fit and a successful launch. And the fifth step to a curriculum as it is developed is to make sure that you assess, you evaluate, and you constantly improve. A curriculum itself is rarely static. It is always evolving. So my five steps that I would recommend to you when you're thinking about a curriculum, define your objectives or your endpoints, then build a curricular map. Organize and create a blueprint as you really think about operationalizing the process. Right-size your curriculum and be alert to those environmental and other political forces. And then always assess, evaluate, and improve. So I'm going to end with just a very practical example, and there are many that we could choose from, but I'm going to speak about designing a curriculum for the medicine clerkship at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. And as I mentioned to you, the five steps I considered. The first is, what were my objectives and my goals in this curriculum? Well, I would say to myself, you know, there are at least 20 kind of core internal medicine knowledge objectives, if you will, the core knowledge that students do need to learn during this clerkship but I really also value their ability to work on their presentation skills and effective communication. I'm gonna acknowledge that this is really a difficult uh, objective, but I do value clinical reasoning, and that, that will be something we emphasize, though it's not something they have to be experts on by the end of that 12-week period, but I always expect uh, professionalism, so that's kind of an expectation. I want the students to emerge from the 12 weeks really able to own the basic skills and knowledge to doctor. Even if there's a lot still left to learn, they can begin the process of putting it together. But, by the way, I don't worry about technical skills, procedures, etc. That's not part of this 12-week effort. 
Now, the second piece I told you about was uh, designing and building a curricular map, and I just kind of uh, scribbled this here just so you could see. I chose, again, more of a blue sky organizational process. I said first, well, I have to think about the timing. You know, maybe I'll have two months on the inpatient block, one month on the ambulatory block, and they do have to be consecutive here, uh, but I want weekends off. That made me uh, just think about that. You know, then I thought about locations, that I need everyone to be at least for one month at the Brigham, but I wonder if I could use the cardiology service or oncology as a place. Then I need a second month at my two other institutions. Students can be at the VA hospital or Faulkner, etc. I discussed all of my assessments here, and then I really began to think, who would I use for my faculty? Is there a core faculty? Or perhaps how do I use my many other faculty members that I would consider non-core? And of course, I just decided I can't lose sight here of this concept. I really need a curricular map to understand all the processes that I'm going to be teaching over the course of 12 weeks. So that was my blue skying process. And then we moved into the blueprint a little more. This is one way we started really getting into the details is, well, we then organize into three, four week blocks and they each have specific dates as you can see here. Uh, and then we begin looking at who's at the Brigham for their four weeks, who's at the Faulkner Hospital, the West Roxbury or the ambulatory month. And then we put each person's name. So you see Paul listed here, but then he's down for the second month in ambulatory. And then he's finally out at the VA. And so the blue here represents one class, the red, the different one, but it's really getting into the details. Now, I was alert as I talked to you about right sizing and fitting into a structure that, you know, I have a lot of students moving around. There's a lot going on in 12 weeks. So from a structural framework, I made sure I talked to my vice chair and they always know what's going on and how this relates to the residency. And I do a lot with primary care. From a human resource frame, I made sure I valued everyone who taught in my clerkship. I do a lot of faculty development. At times, we'll try and do that over a little bit of dinner as well. It just really adds to the value, I think, that the educators feel. And whenever they do come from off-site, we make sure we cover their parking or occasionally try and feed them if it's a lunchtime hour. Now, symbolically, in my clerkship, I always try and do a group picture amongst the students. I think they like that and will remember that. It gives them a real home. I always try and show up at every teaching session, even if it's just for an introduction. And when we talk about politics, I realize that there's a lot of competing demands, uh, and, and I always want to put this in perspective. And of course, the final step was assessing, evaluating, and improving. We do this all the time. Students evaluate confidentially. We also receive some ratings for the clerkship from the medical school centrally, and we give feedback directly to our faculty via some internal reviews. I'm going to conclude with this. Um, again, as we've walked through the last 15 minutes, I think what's important here is understanding a curriculum is a system, it's a plan, it's a process to facilitate teaching and learning, but it's embedded within your viewpoint of the learning process and your conceptual framework for curriculum development. But we should all walk away from this realizing that a curriculum and curriculum development helps learning. There's a lot of broad thinking in developing a curriculum. There's a lot of integration. It's an operations process. And again, don't forget that curriculum live within an organizational structure that you should analyze your curriculum through many different lenses and frames.